Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We want to welcome you all to our quadrennial presidential debate. This is a tradition of the Department of Economics that goes back as far in history as anyone can remember. Uh, when I joined the faculty in the fall of 1976, I joined my colleague, Professor Abrams, who was here only two years before that, in the uh, Ford-Carter debates. And we have one speaker go, and then the other team will have a speaker go. They'll each have eight minutes to talk. And after that, we're going to open it up to questions and answers from the audience. And when we open it up to the audience, I'll go over briefly uh, the guidelines for that section of the program. The program will only go an hour and a half. Uh, it'll be over by 9 o'clock, so you can get back to your rooms to see the second quarter of the Eagles game. Um, just one last thing. If you have a cell phone, iPad, or anything else that rings, beeps, buzzes, or otherwise makes a distracting noise, please either silence it or turn it off now, and uh, we shall begin. All right, starting off tonight, uh, for Team Obama, we have Professor Larry Seidman. I want to ask my students, do you think I can really stop talking at the end of just eight minutes? I'll do my best, and then ask me some questions, give me more time. All right, I want to go back to 2007, the year before we plunged into the Great Recession of 2008 that we're still feeling the effects of. In 2007, we had high GDP, we had high employment, we had low unemployment, unemployment below 5%. And the federal budget was in good shape. I want to repeat that for my good friend, Professor Abrams. The federal budget was in good shape. In 2007, federal spending was 20% of GDP. That's exactly the same percent that it was 10 years earlier in 1997, when it was also 20% of GDP. Federal taxes were 19% of GDP in 2007. That's exactly what they were 10 years ago in, two, in, in 1997. And so the budget deficit was just 1% of GDP, the same as it was 10 years earlier. Federal debt as a percent of GDP was actually lower in 2007. In, two, in 1997, it was 46%. In 2007, it was only 36%. How did that happen? Because we ran relatively small budget deficits over those 10 years, GDP grew at a healthy rate, so debt as a percent of GDP actually came down. The federal budget was well under control in 2007 and had been over the past decade. But then we plunge into the Great Recession, and how did that come about? Was it a big increase in government spending? No. A big tax increase? No. A big increase in government regulation? No. And I think most of you know, it was the bursting of the housing bubble. For five years, financial investors had been bidding up to sky-high prices, housing prices. And they realized they'd overdone it. They started selling. The selling accelerated. And the housing market prices plunged. Nervous investors in the stock market started selling their stock. And the stock market plunged. Big firms started to fail. Credit tightened up. And now comes a key step of how we got thrown into the recession in 2008. When middle-aged consumers looked at the value of their house plummeting and their stock portfolio plummeting, they said, when I retire, I'm not going to be ready for retirement. I, my house isn't going to sell for as much. The stocks are not going to sell for as much. I've got to save some more. I have to consume less to save more. And that was prudent for each individual in 2008, but it was very bad for the economy. When consumer demand goes down, what do producers do? They see less customer demand. They have no choice. They cut their production and lay off workers. The fall in consumer demand started to bring the economy down. The consumers are the job creators. The consumers are the job creators. When consumers are able and willing to spend a lot, producers are delighted to hire more and produce more. But when consumers get nervous from a plunge in housing price or stock price, and when they cut back their spending, the businesses have no choice but to cut production and lay off workers. Now, state and local governments started to cut their spending. Their tax revenue dropped as people were earning less. They're under balanced budget rules. They had to cut their spending. So C plus I plus G, aggregate demand for goods and services, fell. 
And the fall in demand threw us into the Great Recession, initially triggered by the housing bubble bursting. All right, so now the question then is, what do we do in January 2009? In January 2008, unemployment was only 5%. By January 2009, it hit 8%. And so the question becomes, should we focus our policy on stimulating demand for goods and services, which had plummeted, to go back up to normal? Should that be our number one priority? Or should our number one priority be to cut government spending and balance the budget. Now, the federal budget, when the recession occurred, got in trouble. Recessions cause budget problems. Automatically, tax revenue dropped. Tax revenue fell from 19% to 18% to 17% of GDP. Government spending automatically increases. Why? To get money out to unemployed people, food stamps out to people who've lost their jobs. So the budget in trouble as a result of the plunge in a recession. Which do you give as your priority? And here we had a complete opposition of the two political parties. One party said, we have put getting demand back to fight the recession as priority one. I think you know which party that was. The other party said, no, government deficits and government spending are the, the cause of this situation. We've got to cut government spending. We've got to balance the budget. Now, from my point of view, thank God, that we had a president and a House and a Senate all in the hands of the party that believed in stimulating demand back up and saying, yes, when we get out of this, we'll go back to balancing the budget the way we did from 1997 to 2007, but we're going to do first things first. And they had the votes. You need the House, the Senate, and the presidency. They had all of them, and they passed a large $800 billion stimulus bill. Now, it actually wasn't large enough. It should have been twice as big, but it was a good step in the right direction. By the time that stimulus bill started to get into the economy, they passed it in February, just one month after taking office. By the time it started to hit the economy was after April. By April, the unemployment rate had gone to 9%. It had gone from 5% in January 2008 to 9% in April before the new policy could start to go into effect. A few months later, the rise in unemployment stopped at 10%. That was our peak, and it gradually started to subside. You know, in Europe, where they did, where many countries have been cutting budgets as their top priority and cutting spending, they have 11% unemployment. We're at least down to eight, not nearly good enough. Okay. But now here was the trouble. In November 2010, we have a congressional election. And the Republicans win a majority of the House of Representatives. And the new speaker, John Boehner, says, government spending's the problem. Balancing the budget is the number one goal. No more stimulus. And the House of Representatives stopped the stimulus. So we've had two years, 29, 2010, of stimulus. And we have now been under, for two years, the stimulus policy of the House of Representatives. You know, people seem to think we have a, a dictator or a king as president. You need the House, you need the Senate, and you need the White House to get anything done. Anyone can block it. Well, the no stimulus policy the last two years has left us with a very weak recovery. And if that group gets reelected and even gets the White House, we're going to have more no stimulus and more claim that our biggest problem is to cut government spending and balance the budget. I think that'd be extremely dangerous. If you think this recovery is too weak, you should say, we need another round of stimulus. We've got to get back to what we did the first two years and get out of this blockage of the last two and get the economy moving again. Once we get the economy's recovery strong, okay, then we can get back to balancing the budget as we should and we did in the 10 years before we got into this mess. Thank you. Professor Will Harris from Team Romney. Those who have been students of mine know what's in store for you, so just uh, bear, <laughs> bear with me. But it seems to work, so I'll, I'll continue. Um, like many of you and other voters in 2009, I was hoping a young and energetic new president would bring to the country a new era of prosperity and positive change. But starting in 2009, when the last recession ended in June of that year, the U.S. economy has experienced a most disturbing and disappointing so-called recovery. 
Now we have been told, and I'm sure my colleagues on the other side will state tonight, that President Obama inherited a most awful and unprecedented economic downturn. But for his bold action, the situation would have been much worse, that his policies were appropriate and necessary to save us from another great session. But this is simply not true. We are told, for example, that he inherited an economic mess that required bold and significant intervention to fix. But history does not support this. For example, the unemployment rate did, in fact, in 2009, peak at 10 percent. But this was much less than the 10.8% in 1982 and the 11.1% rate in 1921. In both these past recessions, no deliberate federal intervention was undertaking to fix the economy. And within two years after peaking, the unemployment rate fell by more than three percentage points in each of these instances, and the economy grew at more than 4% each year thereafter. Now, let's look, and this is an economics discussion, let's look at first some of the economic promises that Obama has made. And I'm going to discuss three of them. The first one, of course, deals with his landmark legislation, Obamacare. And what did he promise? He promised that in four years there would be $2,500 savings for consumers. The black line shows the decrease in insurance premiums under Obamacare. The bold bar chart shows the actual insurance rates that has occurred between 2008 and 2012. They've gone up by more than $3,000, a $5,000 difference. Obama promised us that, first of all, in 2009, he projected a GDP growth rate of 4.6 percent. His crystal ball must have been a little bit foggy because in 2010, he changed that projection to 4.3 percent. Not to be fooled again, in 2011, he revised it to 3.6%. The actual rate has been 1.77%. Here's the one that, and I'm glad that Professor Simon presented that. Here is what we were told would happen with the stimulus. Without the stimulus, and let me get my magic markers here. Without the stimulus, <laughs> the unemployment rate would go up and then gradually decline. If we adopted the stimulus, it would be much lower and follow this path. We adopted and we followed this path. I guess if we doubled it, we would be up here. <laughs> but then again, I'm not making the projections, others are. And finally, because many of you are young students in here, you don't have a lot of economic uh, history to uh, uh, compare with. So what I would like to do is compare the last nearly four years, three years and 10 months, with what happened in the previous uh, administration. Now, we all know about the failed economic policies of Bush. We've heard that over and over again. So here's what I like to do. I like to give a little quiz. And the quiz is quite simple. It's a matching quiz. And you are to match the failed economic policies of George W. Bush with the hope and change of Barack Obama. For example, average monthly unemployment, Bush versus Obama. One had 5.3, one had 9%. Here's the answer. <laughs> average annual growth in real GDP, 2.0 or 0 0.8. Here's the match. Average federal budget deficits. Bush versus Obama, here's the match. I see a trend. <laughs> Real inflation, median family income. Failed economic policies of Bush under Obama. Okay. We have had, we have tried the stimulus, we've tried hope change, and instead we've gotten, I think, significant. All right, am I on the clock? Okay, so I want to walk you through um, five points of darkness, illustrate to you the fact that Mitt Romney simply does not understand <laughs> economics, explain why Adam Smith, the grandfather of economics, would recommend that you vote for Barack Obama, and if time permits, tell you why a private equity guy should never, ever be elected president. So, um, point of darkness number one, Mitt Romney wants energy independence. Technologically feasible, maybe, 
Um, economically viable, not at all, and I'm going to explain why. So this is an a, a, a picture of energy flow um, from the, the Energy Information Administration. Um, notice that little thing up there, exports. This is through the US, right? About 9% of our energy is actually exports. Does this suggest that we have dependence on other countries overall? Why on earth are we exporting if there's energy dependence? Because this is a global commodity market, and guess what? No US president is going to effectively control a global commodity market. Now, a main point of Romney's energy darkness plan is um, reducing the price of gasoline. So let's take a look at that part of the picture in particular. This gives you a US consumption, production, and net imports of gasoline. Notice, by the way, this little area right down here where this goes up. Who was president then? That oil obstructing Barack Obama. Who was president here when we had this great decline in domestic oil production? <coughs> Not Barack Obama. So um, what's, the, what's the problem here? Well, the US imports about 45% of our oil. Right? We consume about 19 million barrels per day. Canada produces about four. Mexico produces about three. We produce about 10. Right? Everybody do the math there. We're about 2.8 short. Where's that going to come from? We cannot be energy dependent in the oil sector. Energy dependence overall, if you look at current reserves, yes, we can claim that we can have energy dependence overall. The problem is the transportation sector in the US relies 94% on oil as its source of energy. Electricity, 1%. We can be energy independent in the electricity sector. We can't be energy independent in the oil sector. Mitt Romney's not going to be able to single-handedly bring those prices of gasoline down. Here's a, uh, a chart of the uh, supply of oil worldwide. The non-OPEC Americas, which includes countries like Brazil um, and so on, re uh, represent 24% of total oil production. The US consumes 21% of total oil production. North America alone simply will not get us there. Um, unless somehow Mitt Romney can convince all oil companies to sell their oil only to the US at lower prices than they can get where? If we look at growth, 60% growth over the next 20 years, primarily in India and China. Tell me Canada's wanna, gonna wanna sell their oil to us at reduced prices as prices continue to rise in China, in China and India. It's simply not gonna happen. This is a pipe dream. So what's missing from Mitt Romney's analysis? Somebody help Mitt out here, what is this? Yeah, that's a demand curve, all right? Mitt's up in New Hampshire. Can you help me? He needs to hear this. Republicans, encourage him on. D-E-M-A-N-D. Romney doesn't know what it is. We already heard about it from Professor Seidman on the macro side. Here's a clear example of how he doesn't get it on the micro side either. Point number two, darkness, point of darkness number two, trade, currency manipulators, and jobs. Quickly, I'll say Steiger and Sykes, two Sanford economists, have noted that the argument for China's, China's currency manip manipulation would simply not hold water in uh, international courts, trade courts, um, and there's no sustained evidence that China's actions are actually having negative impacts on U.S. trade deficit. Why is that? I'll jump to number three here. Net capital outflow equals net exports. It's an equilibrium identity for trade. We remain the strongest economy in the world. What does that mean? The Chinese and the Indians want to invest their money in the US. We don't take yuan as investments in the US. What do we want them to give us when they invest in the US? Dollars. Where do they get the dollars? By selling us their goods. We're such a good investment, what happens as they try to sell us their goods? They don't get enough dollars because we're not buying enough of their goods, they lower the prices so we buy more. And we end up with, a, with a, um, importing more than we export. It's an accounting identity, an equilibrium identity. Mitt Romney simply doesn't get it. Barack Obama's more balanced approach using trade sanctions judiciously without starting an overall trade war is the right way to go. It's better economic policy. Point of darkness number three, education. Um, actually, the candidates here agree to a large extent, um, but you have to dig a lot on Mitt Romney's website to find much of what he thinks of education. One thing I will point out on the higher education front, a big part of his education policy is to cut Pell Grants. Why? Because private equity kids' children, or private equity folks' children can still go to college without Pell Grants. Many others can't. Gets back to why we should never elect a private equity guy to be president. Nice picture here. We talked about controlling government spending. 
Who does it better? Right. Per capita, real growth in government spending from the Nixon era to the Obama era. Okay, who was worse? Harris said that Reagan didn't spend a lot of money to get the economy back on track. Sure he did. He didn't call it a stimulus plan. What did he call it? Defense spending, right? The two worst cases here, Reagan and Bush. Were they stimulating the economy? You bet they were. They're just liars and they weren't willing to tell you about it. Barack Obama says he's going to do what? Spend judiciously, cut where we can, and raise taxes. That's what the Simpson-Bowles Commission has told us we have to do. The most careful look at this whole issue tells us we have to raise taxes to get us back to um, any kind of balanced budget. By the way, these two instances here, it's worse when the Republicans have both the president and control one or more chambers of Congress. All right, Those are Reagan and Bush. They're spending money like crazy. This notion that Republicans are financially austere is simply misguided. I have a little confession to make. When I was your age, I registered Republican. I'm still a Republican this day. Why? Because I thought Republicans were moderates and fiscally conservative. Unfortunately, I've been shown wrong on both of those points. They're increasingly right-wing, and they're by no means fiscally conservative. Um, small business, missed fifth, fifth point of darkness. We've known since the early 1990s that small businesses are not the engine of economic growth. Why is this one of the top five points in the guy's economic policy? Because he doesn't know economics. Adam Smith would tell you to vote for Barack Obama. Last thing I want to say a little bit about what is private equity. I know a little bit here because my wife worked in the industry for eight years, had to get out because these are some of the slimiest people on earth. What do they do? They maximize shareholder return. They maximize not only just shareholder, but the general partnership's return. These are the private equity partners themselves. Do they care about their limited partners, the people who are actually giving them their money? Not so much. They're all about surplus extraction. Economic efficiency says we should be all about surplus maximization. It's not what private equity people do. They're a greedy, elitist group with a disdain for anyone who makes $3 million a year or actually has less than $3 million in liquid assets. Why? Because to invest in a private equity fund, you have to be a certified investor, which means you need $3 million in liquid assets. It's an elite club. Romney's comments about the 47% only scratch the surface of the man's dark soul. He doesn't care about the most, most of the US population, and he would be a lousy president. Well, I, for one, will not engage in class warfare. Uh, those of you that have had my money and banking class know that I like to use the analogy of steering a ship a uh, large ocean-going ship, and th the same difficulties of steering the ship that economists have in, in, in making decisions about the correct policies. So I'm going to carry on with this analogy and begin with the Obama hope. <laughs> now, those of you under 50 probably have no idea what this thing, the love boat's all about, <laughs> but it was a terrible, silly sitcom that always had happy endings. Well, what about the reality? <laughs> OK, now getting more seriously, here are two important numbers for you to contemplate. The first one, $26,600, $150,000. What can these numbers be? Oh, very interesting. 26000 by the way, bad news on your doorstep is also from a song that you probably don't know anything about either but it's a very famous <laughs> song. Uh, 26,600 turns out to be the average debt of college graduates in 2011. And what's the 150,000? That's going to be your debt, public debt, when you graduate from college. Now, everyone's complaining about having $26,000 worth of debt, but you've got much more debt than that, and we hope you're all going to be taxpayers. That's what you're being trained for by coming to the university. That is a real debt, and you're going to have to pay for it. By the way, 43000 per taxpayer was added in the last four years. But wait, things are getting worse. Here's the predict predictions for the Congressional Budget Office about the uh, national debt. And you can see they're, they're always very optimistic. And as time goes by, they keep raising the prediction. So 2012 is their latest prediction about the growth in the debt. 
and that is optimistic. Uh, during Obama's watch, we've had a downgrade of the credit rating of the United States. This is quite <laughs> embarrassing when it is declared that the United States securities are no longer AAA rated. There's reason why they were downgraded. Uh, the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, put this together a few years ago, two years ago, listing countries that were in danger. Here's a safety line here. On the one axis is net public debt. The more public debt you have is dangerous, so going to the right is a problem. And on the vertical axis going down, which is giving deficits as a percent of GDP, so the bigger the negative here uh, is a negative. So you don't want to be in the lower right-hand quadrant. Well, there's the United States here with other good company, Greece, Spain, Portugal. Oh, the United Kingdom's here. Well, it's been long argued that the United Kingdom and the United States are a little unique because we, uh, we're big capital countries, our uh, currencies are well respected, our debt is well accepted, America has no trouble selling its debt. Well, uh, there's major problems in the UK now. Uh, they've had to impose an austerity program because international capital flows were starting to dry up, not funding their deficits. And now they're marching in the streets in London it will eventually come to that in the United States as well. A little history, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom started the 20th century, year 1900, as the highest income country in the world of, of the developed manufacturing countries. A hundred years later, they had slipped to number 12. So you go from number one to number 12 in a hundred years. How do you do that? You have slower growth, you have uh, bad economic policies that hurt the growth of the country. Uh, and the United Kingdom instituted the Dole, which was major redistribution programs, free health care. All of these things worked to drag down the economies. You know, the United Kingdom had a couple big wars too, but so did Germany and Japan, and they became economic powerhouses uh, by the end of the century. So uh, empirical studies, let's bring some evidence to bear. All the empirical studies that I'm aware of that look at national debt as a percent of GDP, as a percent of income, point to excessive public debt slowing economic growth in an economy. There is a statistical point called a tipping point where it becomes very clear that excessive debt slows economic growth. All the studies that looked at the percentage of debt as a percent of GDP now indicate that the United States has passed the tipping point. That is, our economic growth will be slower than it has been in the past. We can expect that. This slower growth will make unemployment, the unemployment rate, the normal unemployment rate, be higher than it normally is. So we can expect more debt, slowing down in the growth of the economy, higher unemployment rates. Uh, a few words about Obamacare. I don't know what alternative universe the Obama administration lives in, but they think that Obamacare is not going to add any more to the budget and to our debt. I went through a little subsidy calculator that showed that a family of four earning $80,000 a year would receive over $9,000 in cash subsidy in the form of uh, tax credit, which can be cashed uh, the following year. A family of 80,000 is suddenly going to be getting a 9,000, where, where is all this money gonna be coming from? Uh, the estimates for Obamacare, way underestimated. Uh, they just don't add up in terms of their expenses. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid are all gonna grow. President Obama has greatly expanded the Medicaid program, healthcare for free, essentially. This is going to require massive taxes uh, in order to try to balance this in any sensible way or precipitate a debt crisis for the United States. 
I'm glad they mentioned the Simpson-Bowles Commission, President Obama's bipartisan commission to solve the debt problem. As soon as it was proposed, he dropped it like a hot cake. That showed no leadership. He could have adopted it and said, let's get on with it. Many of Romney's proposals are consistent with the Bowles Commission. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Hoffman will now speak for the Obama team. Remember that landmark piece of health care legislation passed during the Bush administration. If you don't remember, well, I don't either. They didn't do anything. They were in control of the, the presidency for eight years and the Senate for four years, but they didn't do anything. So I asked myself, what would they have done if they'd actually wanted to do something about health care problems? And frankly, the answer was really easy. President Bush would have wanted something based on Republican principles, ideally something that had come out of a Republican-leaning think tank. And he would have looked for something that had been tried at the state level, preferably a state that had a Republican governor. So what do you think he would have done? There's not much doubt that he would have landed on Romney Care, that Massachusetts health care reform based on a proposal from the very, very conservative Heritage Foundation. He would have seen how remarkably simple it was. He would have grasped its basic principles. Number one, everybody has health insurance. No more free riding. Number two, insurance camp and companies can't deny coverage just when you need it. And number three, the government subsidizes health insurance if people can't afford it. Simple. He would have seen that it wasn't a government takeover. He would have seen that it kept in place the employer-based insurance system that we already have. He would have embraced it, if he was smart, as in a perfect example of compassionate conservatism. So yes, if the Bush administration had wanted to do something, what they would have come up with would have nearly been identical to what we now know as Obamacare. It would have been known to historians as Bush Care, an accomplishment so great that it would almost have outweighed all the other blunders of his administration. Now, of course, the Republicans weren't the least bit interested in health care reform. And in the end, all they have ever done about health care is demonized the Affordable Care Act and pretend it is something that it really isn't. So let me tell you what it is. It is a truly landmark piece of legislation that finally, and really quite belatedly, brings the United States into the company of the many other developed countries around the world that provide near universal access to health care. It recognizes the principle that health care is too important to depend on family income, and that there is no excuse, no excuse, for a country as wealthy as the United States to have 49 million citizens without health care. It comes pretty close to providing universal health care access. It will make us healthier. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say those are good things. Those are very good things. Here's what it is not. It is not a government takeover of the health care system, and I don't care how many times Republicans say it is. It is not. It is not a single-payer government-run health insurance plan. It will not bankrupt us. The, rich, the richest country on earth cannot afford health care for its citizens. I have only this to say. Give me a break. Give me a break. The goal for the next president is to, is to improve the Affordable Care Act, strengthen it, and work on cost issues that were not addressed in that politically toxic environment when the bill was passed. The bill included seed money for every single health care cost containment idea out there. And we need to start seeing how they work and what we can implement broadly. We need to fix some details. The health care industry is complicated. We'll need to tweak it. So what will Gover Governor Romney do if he is elected? Well, he has a two-part plan for health care reform that in its totality is as follows. I'm going to read this carefully. Number one, repeal the Affordable Care Act. And number two, and here's the tricky part, provide guidance to the states for any reforms that they may choose. Now, that's pretty technical stuff, so I'm going to translate it into language that everybody can understand. Here's what he's saying. I have no idea at all what to do. And frankly, I don't care whether anything ever gets done. Yeah, I used to be in favor of a system exactly like the Affordable Care Act, but now I'm afraid I've never agreed to 
and that included $3 in spending cuts for every $1 of revenue increase. But Boehner walked away at the last minute because he couldn't get his own party to support any revenue increase. I repeat, any revenue increase. Governor Romney has told us over and over that he plans to cut tax rates for the wealthy, which by itself would increase the debt by $5 tri trillion. Now, I'll point out, trying to solve a debt, a debt problem by making it $5 trillion bigger as your first step seems a little curious to me. He claims that he would not reduce revenues or increase taxes on the middle class. He's provided no specifics or laughably unrealistic ones. At the second debate, he casually proposed a cap on deductions. I think it was the $17,000 or the $25,000 number he sort of tossed out. That would cover, according to analysts, less than one-third of the tax cut. And in the debate, he said, well, it will add up. And then I think I'm quoting correctly, he said, because I'm a businessman, whatever that might have to do with it. Again, I say, give me a break. The guy's been running for president for 18 months on a revenue-neutral tax cut reform, and he still has no idea what he's talking about. Um, Representative Ryan does have a plan to cut spending, he tr and he, it's really unbelievably severe. He wants to cut it to three spending on everything other than Social Security and health care, including defense, to 3.75%. If we do that, we will be left with nothing. We will be left with nothing. Thank you. And I will look forward to your questions later. The uh, recession in 1990, this is the slowest, and it's getting slower. We're going from 2.4%, 2% last year, and less than that this year. Bounce back has usually been 4 to 6% recovery, generally within two years. Now, as the uh, first speaker said, uh, the idea, he says, is that we should stimulate the economy by a big stimulus package to boost consumption. However, consumption before that had been largely supported by very high housing values, not by income. And when those housing values came down from the historical highs, they are naturally exposed to the fact that people really did not have the consumption to support uh, the income to support that consumption. So the stimulus package just gives little uh, boost to, of income to people to consume. It's not really going to work. We need new sources of income. Now, the stimulus package was based on an economic theory that was discredited more than 30 years ago. We don't even teach that theory in our graduate programs anymore. And uh, the theory is that when those jobs, uh, when demand disappears, those jobs stay there. And when demand comes back in, then those jobs are still there for people. But in a modern economy, jobs disappear. And new jobs are created all the time. It's a dynamic process. What has happened in this recession is, as you can see, the unemployment rate has stayed very high. What has happened is job creation has stopped. So the layoffs have stopped, but the job creation is not occurring anymore. So what we have to do here is improve investment. We have to encourage new firms to come out and invest. And uh, so what is stopping firms from coming out to invest? And I'll show you. What we have here is a trend in new businesses. Now, it was commented uh, with no data uh, that um, Small business is not the engine of creation. Really, it's young businesses, young dynamic businesses that grow into things like Apple Computer and stuff like that. As you can see, the US has enjoyed a burst in uh, new firms. It started, coincidentally, with Reagan's tax cuts and has continued until very recently. And this is the other reason this is an unusual recession, is those young, dynamic, um, highly productive firms that create the new high-wage jobs that will support the income, that will create the tax revenue, that will pay for all the government spending and our own, are not occurring anymore. Now, <clears throat> so we can ask why. What is different about this recession that those jobs are not being created, those firms are taking a dive like that? Well, uh, is it because they're not making enough profit? No, they are making profit, but the investment's not occurring. Why? Well, if you ask them, 
which is something the Obama administration doesn't do, uh, they tell you that the administration has not created a very business-friendly environment. In fact, Steve Jobs directly told Obama himself that without a more job-friendly environment or business-friendly environment, there will be no recovery and you'd be a one-term president. We can only hope so. All right, now you don't have to believe just a brilliant entrepreneur like Steve Jobs. We can go on to a bunch of surveys that say the same thing. We have the National Federation of Independent Business, top two concerns, taxes and regulation. We have World Bank, cost of doing business, U.S. dropped from 4 to 13th, tax and tax complexity, World Economic Forum, global competitiveness, U.S. has dropped from second to fifth, cronyism, policy non-transparency and regulation. We have the Fraser Economic uh, Index of Freedom, economic freedom. We've dropped in one year, 10th to 18th, because of um, unsure property rights, legal, unsure legal rights for business, uh, government size and spending, and we have the Heritage Foundation, economic freedom, four-year drop, because of tax complexity and debt of the government. This legacy of, of uh, distrust by government is a result of bailouts, subsidies to favored companies, arbitrary waivers from regulation, a tidal wave of regulation that make it impossible to adequately evaluate the profitability of companies and therefore investors are not investing. In other words, investors have stopped. They are sitting on their cash they have already voted against this administration. They are not going to invest because they do not trust this administration. Therefore, the tax revenue that we so desperately need to finance the vast expansion of the Obama um, government and the jobs that you need are not going to occur. A tidal wave of regulations favors already entrenched business. There are 106 major regulations four times what occurred under Bush, five times the cost of what uh, occurred under Bush. They also entrench special interests like Frank Dodd, major Wall Street banks, uh, GM and um, Chrysler were bailed out at the expense of other um, competitors in that field. Uh, and there's a tidal wave to come, more than 4,000 are expected to come in a second Obama administration. Uh, the tax increases that we can expect under Obama amount to 3% of GDP. This is an ex almost exactly the amount that Reagan cut back in 1983 that sparked a tidal wave of young firms that created the great moderation of growth that we've enjoyed for over 20 years. <clears throat> Debt and deficit are a consequence of the great slowdown we're in but they are also a cause because business realizes they're not stupid. They realize taxes are gonna go up and it really doesn't matter if it goes up on them or their customers. The fact is taxes go up. There is going to be a contraction and the estimate is that there will be at least a million jobs lost. This is CBO incidentally, 1.6. Um, <clears throat> now um, one of uh, the speakers mentioned, for example, venture capital on slimy, greedy stinkers that they are, finance medical innovation. And you can be sure those slimy, stinker venture capitalists will eventually find the cure for cancer. However, under the Obamacare legislation, uh, the uh, venture capitalists have dropped their funding of those um, greedy, stinking bastards that they are, um, 40%. This is one of our most promising industries. Uh, those jobs are already leaving this country. Those companies are moving to Ireland. Some are moving to China and some are just shutting up shop altogether. This is a valuable source of income producing jobs and additional exports that we could look forward to that will not occur. Uh, just a few mo moments, let me talk about Obamacare. Oh, I have to stop. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I have a few more things to say there, but I'll wait for questions. Well, amazingly, we have all these distinguished professors actually finishing on time. Uh, we're now going to open it up for questions and answers. We have some students here who are going to walk around with microphones, uh, giving you an opportunity to ask questions. Just as we um, 
Let, let me explain what's going to happen. If you ask a question to one team, they'll have three minutes to answer. The other team will have a minute and a half to respond, and then the first team will have 30 seconds. If you ask a question to both teams, it'll be two minutes, two minutes, one and one. Uh, finally, I would like to say that we just want questions. So we're also going to time the questions. At 30 minutes, you'll get a yellow card, and at 45 minutes, you'll get a reg or 30 seconds. Sorry, 30 seconds. Yeah, that's what we're afraid of is the 30-minute question. Uh, in 30 seconds, you'll get a yellow card. In 45 seconds, you get a red card, and the question is up. So we want to begin. Who has a question? Um, yeah, go ahead. I think this question goes uh, mostly to Dr. Beck. Uh, my question was, you talked about the new jobs uh, created from new technology, and you actually mentioned uh, research institutions, like research institutions that uh, look at cancer research. But um, do you think that Romney is missing an opportunity cost by his plan actually cutting uh, funding to places like the National Institutes of Health and the National F Science Foundation to balance the budget? I've heard, I've, I have not heard of any proposal uh, by the Romney administration to cut that kind of funding. Um, I have not heard any proposal like that. I can tell you, though, that there's a very active private venture capital um, industry in financing medical research, and that that industry was actually the first to um, finance the mapping of the human genome, all right? So... Uh, yeah, I think that um, public funding for research is very important, but even more important is private funding, and that funding is drying up. I have heard no proposal by Romney to cut that. Okay, would the Obama team like to answer? Well, uh, Romney has made almost no specific proposals about anything. Now, and, that's, and so it's no, it's no coincidence that this happens to be one of the things that he has not told us about. But as Ryan's plans for the budget are to cut severely everything that's not Social Security, health care, and defense. And he would cut that to less than 1% of GDP, and it has never been less than 6% of GDP. So you can assume that most of the go basic government services that we assume, that we depend on, that we rely on, would not be there, including something like the kind of funding for NIH that we all depend on and that we need. So I mean, it makes sense to me. Uh, the Romney team has 30 seconds if they'd like to reply. Well, I just heard recently that Big Bird, uh, the person that, uh, 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 <laughs> Big Bird dressed, it makes $750,000 a year salary, so maybe we can cut something like Big Bird and fund the health care that you propose. <laughs> it's called rearranging priorities. Okay, and another question? Okay. Okay, uh, the Democratic side kind of answered this, so this is at the Republican side. <clears throat> um, Recently in the New York Times, it was pointed out by some people in the Romney camp that uh, Paul Ryan will take an activist VP role, similar to uh, Dick Cheney on national security, but on economic issues. So if looking at this, in light of this, uh, and his policies and his proposals on the budget, uh, what do you think that spells out uh, for <clears throat> Romney if he is to be president and, his, uh, and Paul Ryan's proposals to half uh, the current levels of discretionary spending? Well, Romney's going to be the president, and I don't know any vice president that dominates on those kinds of policy decisions. But I, I do agree uh, with most of the policy proposals by, uh, that have been proposed by the, the, the possible vice president. Um, I think we need to start cutting government. This is a very serious issue. The debt that's piling up is enormous. The amount of waste in government is incredible. Uh, we saw that we didn't get into the micro policies of the uh, Obama administration, but the wasteful subsidies of green energy, the Solyndra company that went bankrupt with $500 million lost, that would give $2 million to everyone in this room. I think we could have done a lot better. Um, and cash for clunkers, which cost $2,000 of net welfare loss per vehicle sold, and the auto industry sold no vehicles more than expected during that year. They bunched the sales up, 
during the few months that the cash for clunkers was offered and then sales dropped down. It added nothing and it was a wasteful program. It encouraged people to buy vehicles they didn't need and destroy vehicles that were perfectly good. That's the waste on a microeconomic level will fill textbooks for years to come. Okay, Obama team. Can I yeah, just respond? Uh, when, I, when I talked, I said that uh, the other side would talk about cutting government spending, they talk about regulation, but there'd be no talk about the collapse of demand that caused this recession. You know, by the time that President Obama's stimulus plan was getting underway in early 2009, the unemployment rate was already 9%. It had risen from 5 to 9. Are we really going to believe that it was now some regulation that occurred after that that was the key to getting our economy stuck? When you ask business people what's their number one concern, it's that their customers don't have the money and aren't spending enough. That's the number one thing that comes out of surveys. And if you're a business person and your customers don't have the money to spend, are you going to are you going to expand production and hire workers? Now, what President Obama said was, let's give a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars to each family. They'll save some of it, but they'll spend some of it. And when producers see customer demand, they will hire and they will produce. When other businessmen see that, they will invest more. Why aren't the job creators in business? doing this kind of thing now. It's not their fault. It's not profitable, it makes no sense for business to make investments and innovations when they can't sell the product because there's no demand there. I would like to hear my friends and colleagues talk about the concept of aggregate demand for a change. Okay, uh, Romney team, you have 30 seconds to reply. Uh, as far as the um, supposed um, harshness of the Ryan plan, uh, the, uh, Romney, first of all, is the um, president. Obviously, he has uh, talked about restoring spending from the 24% of GDP it's taking up now back to the 20% of 2007. So we're really not talking about huge cuts here. We're talking about going back to the spending levels of 2007, which many thought were rather high. But I also want to talk about um, Ryan's plan has been described by analysts for Moody's and S&P and other um, analysts as not enough, okay? We are heading towards okay. a crisis, and <laughs> it's not enough. You'll get more time later to say something. My question is to the Romney team. Um, Governor Romney has said in the previous debates that he intends cutting loopholes to um, balance the, the budget and to close the deficit. And can we know what kind of loopholes he's talking about and about how much money he intends to, to get from these um, loopholes to, to close the deficit? Thank you. Well, the people uh, probably don't know that the loopholes that we have in our tax code now provides $1 trillion worth of subsidies. They are enormous. If we did away with every loophole in the tax code, we would reduce, we'd raise actually a trillion dollars worth of revenue as a result because these are tax rebates that are given that are called tax expenditure programs that are no different than actual cash subsidy programs, $1 trillion. Uh, the Bowles Commission said we had to drastically reduce these tax expenditure programs. We had to uh, broaden the tax base. Uh, at this point, President, uh, Governor Romney, <laughs> wishful thinking, um, <laughs> has uh, said he would put a cap on family deductions. So it, it wouldn't be specified what you could de deduct. It wouldn't be a categorical elimination of deductions at the present time. I would, uh, if I have my own views on it, uh, I'd like to get rid of all of them. Uh, that would solve that problem. But uh, at this point, obviously, any politician, and most of these politicians, by the way, will not give specific uh, recommendations because they're going to irritate somebody, right? So if you start talking about reducing the home uh, interest 
deduction, which, by the way, Canada doesn't have uh, and most other countries don't have. If you talk about getting rid of those things, you'll immediately infuriate a huge portion of the population. So any change has to be done gradually. It has to be done slowly. And probably capping it and lowering the cap over time makes a lot of sense. Canada actually doesn't have. Um, I agree with Professor Abrams, you know, tax reform would be a wonderful thing. It's politically a very difficult thing. As soon as Romney was pushed on the uh, mortgage interest deduction, he said, oh, no, 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 I didn't really mean that one. I meant the other loopholes, right? He has no real plan. The plan that he does have, actually, Martin Feldstein, who is a uh, Romney backer, has noticed that the math adds up if you impose a substantial tax increase on people in the $100,000 to $250,000 tax bracket who Romney had previously said he would not touch. Um, by the way, it doesn't increase taxes on those above that range. If we look at his balanced budget plan more generally, um, this I love, right? You, you heard in the second debate when a woman asked about tax reform and he said, I'm not going to raise taxes on the middle income. In fact, I want you to know that under my plan, we're going to cut taxes for interest, dividends, and capital gains. How many people do you know making 70000 a year who have a major source of income from income, dividends, and capital gains? How many private equity? <laughs> I know your income's higher no, than 70000 Will. My mom. I can guarantee you who that tax cut is directed at. All right. It's called people who have $3 million or more in liquid assets who invest in private equity funds. It's part of the club. It's not a plan to balance the budget. It's a plan to treat the buddies in the club. Okay. Uh, Romney team, you have 30 seconds. I didn't raise my hand to brag. I was speaking for my 89-year-old mother who lives off dividends from Verizon's and uh, interest on her and a lifetime of investment. Okay. Another question. <laughs> Uh, before I ask my question, I'd just like to comment on, I think that hope is still part of the Obama campaign slogan. It's just hope the interest rates don't go up, because if they do, we're in big trouble. Um, everybody here knows that economics is about constraints. Um, but for the past four years, there haven't really been any meaningful constraints on federal borrowing. Um, interest rates have been near zero. Uh, I wish I could put up that graph that Dr. Arnold had in his presentation, because it showed how much government spending grew under Reagan and Bush, uh, who faced much tighter constraints than Obama has faced. Um, given the failure of demand stimulus to actually generate meaningful economic growth um, with zero constraints, um, is it not more plausible that there's something else going on here? Is there some other mystical, mysterious factor okay. that's causing this? I think this is a question for the Obama team. <laughs> uh, First, you, you, say that, you say that the stimulus did no good. What's that based on? If you give people $2,000, they'll save some of it, but they'll spend some of it. And then producers will say, I see I've got customers, and I'll hire more customers. You know, in, in Europe, they've been doing the reverse in several countries. They've been cutting government spending. They've been not getting money into people's pockets. Their unemployment rate is higher. Now, nobody can prove whether it worked or didn't work, we don't have a time machine that can rerun the experiment, okay? So you're gonna have to use some common sense. Now, on your point about debt, maybe I didn't make myself clear. Suppose we had put debt, stopping the debt from rising our number one priority back in 2009. We could have stopped it. We could have, when tax revenue fell from 19% down to 17, 16% of GDP, we could have slashed government spending to come down to 16% of GDP, and we could have balanced the budget and had no borrowing. And we would have been proud of our numbers that the debt didn't rise. And you know what we would have had? We would have had a, a Great Depression number two, because demand would have collapsed. Now, what I'd like to hear is the people putting up the charts about deficits and debt, all of which were run up since we got into the recession, to answer what would happen if you had cut the budget, cut the government spending, collapse demand even further. I'd like to hear somebody explain to me what would happen with that. Can I answer? Um, the idea here that uh, Romney campaign is uh, putting forth is that the um, aggregate demand will be supported by tax cuts that will also promote the investment that we need, the sector of the economy that is AWOL, 
right now, and that that investment will lead to higher wages and more jobs down the road. So the missing, missing sector is investment. Investment has been very discouraged, and a cut in taxes will encourage that. The Romney plan intends to, uh, a good deal of that will be offset, according to the Tax Foundation, about 60%. That only leaves about 40% to be covered by cl closing loopholes. And the Romney campaign has uh, mentioned capping deductions on rich people as a rather um, strong way of raising a good deal of money from rich people, which of course seems to be a big focus of concern over there. Um, so, uh, in fact, we have talked about it. It's just that it's not the way that the Obama administration feels it ought to be done. It's investment. We have to encourage investment. A reply, 30 seconds. This gets back to Romney doesn't understand demand. These surveys that Professor Beck talked about, when you ask businesses questions like, if the business environment was less risky, would you invest more? They say yes. And then it doesn't happen, and you say, why aren't you investing more? And they say, because people aren't buying my products. It all gets back to demand. On the government spending side, there is, there is yet to be anything close in a Romney proposal that actually balances the budget. It, it's, you know, the tax revenue's not there. The spending is cuts aren't there. It doesn't work. Okay, another question. Up here, yeah. Uh, thank you. My question is for both uh, sides, and it's a two-part question. And the first question is actually for both sides and for everybody in the room. Um, I have a please raise your hand, uh, either side, if you would recommend. Imagine that you're an economic advisor to your respective candidate. Please raise your hand if you would recommend that to your advisor that he should run on a platform of zero or negative consumer spending. Increase. A decrease or zero consumer spending? Yeah, you have 15 seconds. Okay, so that means that, that means that everybody would like to increase consumer spending. And I'm, my question, my second question to the panel then, is how, would, how do you propose to do that on a planet with finite resources? And please refrain from using efficiency or technology in your answer. Each have well, two I'm minutes. Not, I'm not sure why we would refrain from using technology in our answer. You're, you're suggesting Malthusian economics, which was, which was long ago discredited because of technological advances, allowing us to produce more with less. So I, I'm not sure where that question goes. Okay, Romney. We actually can agree on this. <laughs> <laughs> I take it that's it. Another question. <laughs> So, uh, Paul Ryan continuously goes on TV and announces how he's planning on slashing taxes across certain demographics. Um, and he keeps saying how this is going to be a revenue neutral plan. Um, so, the Laffer curve aside, assuming that that's like a real thing, which again is debated, supposedly if now we're on the left hand side of it, how is that, um, how is that possible? Can you, I guess, uh, the Republican side, can they explain that? I guess this is for the Romney team. You have three minutes. Well, I'll address the, the dynamics of the Laffer curve. Um, there, there has to be a Laffer curve. It's not, if you have a 100% tax rate, there's zero taxes. If you have a zero tax rate, there's zero taxes. Somewhere in between a zero and 100%, you have to have a maximum. So that's all the Laffer curve says. Now, whether we're to the left or to the right, how can you uh, cut taxes if you're to the left of the maximum point? And the answer to that is something called a dynamic Laffer curve, that over time, if taxes are cut and there's more investment and there's more dynamic growth in the economy, tax rates will, tax, total taxes will rise at that same tax rate. So that would be a, sort of a simple answer uh, to your question. Okay, Re response? No response. Okay, uh, next question. There's some questions down front here also. All right, uh, I have a question for uh, the Democrats on the panel. Um, Obama seems to be very upset about Mitt Romney's tax rate of about 15%. Uh, I, I have a question um, s more specifically about capital gains rates. Uh, do you think that we should be increasing T uh, taxes on wealthy capital gains rates uh, in a recession, how will that encourage job creation? And then um, 
the second part, uh, or the part B of that, uh, should there be different treatment of labor and capital uh, in our tax system? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, it's a good question. We, and I want to separate. I've been talking short-run recession the whole night, but I, I'm interested in long-run problems, too. I teach public finance as well as macro. Uh, you've got to separate the two. In the recession, okay, we don't want to raise taxes. We want to keep taxes low in the recession so people have the spending power, as I've been emphasizing. It's when we get back to a normal, healthy economy with strong demand, then we've got issues of what kind of tax system do we want. And we have to consider fairness as well as efficiency. Um, I think that you've got to balance uh, those two. You can push too high. You can push tax rates too high on either labor or capital and over discourage the supply of those. And you have to worry about that over the long run. On the other hand, there are serious fairness issues. Okay? It's a fact that very high income folks make a lot of their money out of capital income. All right? So if you go very lightly on that, you're losing a lot of revenue from people who could afford to pay more. Now, nothing against them, but then you've got health care needs, you've got the elderly, you've got all kinds of things that government has to take care of and raise revenue for. The less you raise from the very high income folks, the more you're going to have to raise from middle and low income. So it's a balancing that you've got to do, a sensible balancing. And I think you're raising a good question about the long run. Response? <clears throat> um, I should point out that the... Um Obama administration is planning to raise taxes 3% of GDP, which is a lot. That is a huge increase in the middle of a very stagnant economy. So uh, this talk about it's a bad idea to raise uh, taxes at a time like this, it sure is true. Now, the, this is why the Obamacare legislation is such a bad idea. It is an increase on everybody, capital and labor, now, uh, there's been a lot of work on capital income taxes. You may want to raise them because you feel rich should pay more, but the reality is that it's uh, highly elastic, and therefore, when you raise taxes very much on capital, you don't get much in return. What you do in terms of tax revenue, but what you do do is uh, lose a lot of uh, productive activity. So, <clears throat> however much you may want to raise ca uh, capital income taxes, it just doesn't yield that much in a globalized world. Now, uh, the uh, choice to take on health care, um, in fact, the Bush administration did propose this. They were stonewalled by a filibuster back around the time that the Twin Towers were bombed, and that's why this has all been forgotten. It was a bipartisan plan. This plan would have been a lot less expensive and would not have required this gigantic tax increase and it would have worked on the um, employer-based care and then subsidies to those who needed insurance in the individual market. Okay, you have 30 seconds to reply. I can say a little bit, of, you know, we ought to close loopholes in capital gains taxes as well. Um, again, I'm not averse to the private equity industry. I just don't think a private equity investor should ever be president because they don't have the right mindset for it. They're all about rent extraction, maximizing their own surplus, not maximizing general surplus and economic efficiency. To give you an example, in the private equity world, um, the private equity general partnership, the Mitt Romneys of the world, get returns on 20% of the money invested in the fund. They put in 5%. They pay capital gains tax on the entire amount. Why that's not income and is a capital gain for them, I don't know. OK, thank you. Another question? No, it was a directed question to one side. Okay, this, uh, this question is mostly aimed at the Obama-Biden side, but I'm sure the Romney side would like to comment. With regards to estate and inheritance taxes, uh, several years ago an article was written by several media sources advocating the repeal of those taxes based on the precedent set by how much the economy grew in Sweden and how many companies came back to put their businesses back in Sweden when they repealed their inheritance taxes. Why does the, what, what, what's, your, what's the Obama-Biden reasoning behind not repealing those taxes in order to allow much more investment within the private sector and the reasons for repealing those as with Romney's platform? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's the, the estate uh, and gift tax applies to only a very, very tiny percentage of very, very wealthy people in the U.S. It's less than 1%. And the Obama side 
does not want that to become a tax that applies to a lot of people. The question only is whether that very, very top group should continue to pay it or not. Okay? Well, that can be, you know, that's a reasonable thing that you can debate. But to act as though that's a major factor in our business environment, I mean, there is a real issue as to whether we should be using more consumption-type taxes once we get back to a normal, healthy economy, like a value-added tax, which almost every other country in the world uses, but we don't, in order to get us the revenue we need, along with spending cuts to balance the budget, that that might be a better way to go. But this estate tax issue is a very small amount of revenue, and it has a very minor effect on the whole business climate in, in the country. Reply or Romney team. Well, I, I, what I find remarkable is the the Obama group and Keynesians just really dislike savings. In 2011, our net national savings was negative. This is the way you bankrupt the country. When you start sending signals that people that accumulate wealth are going to lose it when they die, they leave with that wealth. Uh, this is another way to reduce savings in a country, to reduce the capital formation. So I'm, I'm, I'm really opposed to any of those types of taxes because I think people, when they earn their income, they pay taxes on it. And when they establish their estates for their descendants, they should have not be punished for doing such things. So that would be my answer to that. And, and I think the Republicans have a much better position on the uh, state tax. The Re Republicans are opposed to most taxes, if not all taxes. The problem is they still want to spend some money. And to do one, you need to do the other. OK, you have a Romney team has a minute to reply if they choose. No? OK, next question. There's hands up all over. Hi, so I was curious what, for the Obama team, what would be your response to someone who said that the Detroit bailout was maybe unnecessary and we should have let those companies reform themselves or let foreign companies take over those factories and that those jobs would not have been lost and those workers would not be laid off or unemployed? Yeah. Um, timing is, is really crucial here, okay? We, you have to go back. I think everybody here is old enough to remember what it was like in the fall of 2008 and early 2009. Our economy was plummeting. Psychology was very negative. People were very nervous. People were very frightened. I think if at that time, that crucial time, we had allowed General Motors and Chrysler to go bankrupt in the sense of liquidation. Cars made, and they, they, they did a list of the 10 most reliable cars that were made in 2008, 2009, and the 10 least reliable cars. Leading the list of least reliable cars were three GM and four Chrysler models. 70% of the least reliable cars were made by the two that Obama chose to bail out. Not a single GM or Chrysler car was in the most reliable category. We had Hondas, we had Fords, we had Toyotas. The resources that were wasted on companies that produce cars that people don't like, that are unreliable, was denied to the companies that could make cars that are the most reliable and the highest quality. That's the kind of mentality we need, not a bunch of handouts for votes. Thank you. So I was, I was, I was at a conference of the uh, Industrial, Economic, Industrial Organization Society a couple of years ago, and they had a very nice study of this whole quality issue. And it turns out around the 1992-93 uh, the era, the uh, statistically significant difference. Nobody really knows, although I don't think it could be any worse than what we've seen under the thing. There's a lot of interesting historical examples and, uh, of previous recessions where doing nothing was the best thing to do. It was interesting. We had a major recession in 1921. There was President uh, Harding. He did not take the advice of his very astute uh, 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 Commerce Secretary Hoover who wanted to intervene. He did nothing. Within th two years after the unemployment peaked at 11%, it was
was down to around 5%. Hoover had a chance to intervene in 1929. He turned a recession into a Great Depression by intervening. So the answer is we don't know, but history tells us that if you get out of the way and let the economy correct and, and restore itself, it does a marvelously effective job. What we've seen so far doesn't do a very good job. So I have a couple comments here. I'm glad they brought this up because you know, in the end, what our macroeconomists know about how the economy works is incredibly little. It's all based on representative agent models. So what you've been hearing my distinguished macroeconomist colleagues quote here is based on models that understand very little about the economy. We know demand is important. I disagree fundamentally with Professor Harris about what would have happened had we sat back and done nothing in 2009. I think, as Professor Seidman has argued fairly clearly, that would have been a disastrous approach to take. Another thing, I mean, there, the, the big difference here is, you know, on this side we tend to hear lots about long-run economic growth. Um, no real acknowledgement that short-run business cycle fluctuations actually happen and can be quite severe. As Keynes famously noted, in the long run, we are all dead. I'd rather focus a little bit more attention on some of these short-run fluctuations, which is exactly what the Obama administration did in 2009. At the beginning of a recession that was left to them by things like the housing bubble, right, which occurred in part through some of the behavior of uh, hedge funds in the derivative securities market, where the SEC regulations called for no more than 11 times leveraging, and the Bush administration was... Um, enforcing those regulations to no more than 40 times leveraging. So when things started to go, they went big because of a lax regulation on, on the part of the Bush administration in that area. Okay, Romney, you have 30 seconds. Uh, we do know one thing. There's absolutely no economic evidence that you can tax and spend your way to prosperity. We know that for sure. And we're going to get both under President Obama. We've gotten lots of spending. We're still in a recession. And we're going to get a big tax in um, two, uh, 2013. We will not get prosperous under these policies. So we know that much. Next question. Lots of hands up. Down here, down there, OK. So Apple Computer had was taxed 2% on their foreign profit of $35 billion. Um, what does that mean? Uh, and this is to the Obama administration. What is the Obama administration going to do about bringing that investment back to America? I'm not sure what the question is. No. I'm not following the question. <laughs> They were taxed 2%, only 2%. Whereas if they brought that, those, that money, that profit, back to America, instead of spending it back in those other countries, they would have been taxed 35%. There's a 33% difference there. So what they want to do, what Tim Cook has, and Jobs have continually told the presidents, is that they need to do something to encourage them to bring that money over. Talking about the business, I, I think you're you're raising the issue of a business disincentive because of the higher corporate tax rates here than elsewhere in the world. Is that is that what you're yeah. focusing on there? So, well, we we need to make sure our corporate tax rate is not out of line with other countries. But at the same time, we've got to raise sufficient revenue. So that is a concern. The Obama administration has talked about cutting the corporate tax rate, but also closing some loopholes and preferences so that there's enough revenue raised so that when we do get out of this recession, this is after you come out of the recession, we will start balancing the budget. And by the way, I don't, I don't know what Professor Beck keeps talking about, about a tax increase coming from the Obama administration. As long as we're in recession, the policy of, the, uh, of our side has been we're going to keep taxes low on middle class people so that they can keep spending. And we're not going to cut government spending so the government can keep sending money into state and local governments so they won't have to lay off people and so forth. So this tax and spend our way to prosperity, I don't, I don't get it. It's not what our proposal is. We want to keep taxes low and government spending up as long as we're in recession. Now, here's what I want to say. All of us up here have secure jobs 
And I know that President Harker somewhere here is a nice, solid institution we're grateful for working for. You're the folks on the front line, okay? You're the ones having to go out and seek a job next year or the year after. And if you support the policy that is wrong for getting those jobs up, okay, you're going to be the ones who pay the price, not any of us. So you ought to think very hard about what is it that makes jobs? Is it when businesses see demand for their products? And which policy is willing to get money into the hands of people so that they will demand those products? The others keep talking about regulation, the badness of government, and all the other things. None of that is going to make you any jobs. Can I reply? Well, I'd like to say that even with the corporate deductions that are allowed, the United States has one of the highest corporate I income taxes in the world. Its nominal tax rate is the highest in the world. It's higher than China. China's corporate tax rate is much lower than the United States. We live in a global economy. We need to have investment. We can't scare uh, firms away and leaving the United States. And how do you remain competitive? You lower those tax rates. Uh, the growth that occurs as a result provides the income and the production that raises our standard of living. Um, and so we need saving, we need investment. Uh, lowering the corporate tax rate, President Obama's had four years in the White House. I haven't seen the corporate tax rate come down uh, at all, and there have been no proposals to do so. Team Obama, you have 30 seconds. The, the Obama administration has proposed cutting the corporate rate some, but it's got to close. This is all when we come out of the recession, but we've got to be able to raise enough revenue by closing loopholes so that when we do get out of the recession, we do start balancing the budget. Now, when the Romney side says we want permanent tax rate cuts of 20 percent, then he doesn't tell you about these loopholes that he's going to close. All right. Cutting rates 20 percent is going to be a huge reduction in tax revenue, even prosperous economy, which is going to put us in big budget deficit trouble, which they claim they're so concerned about. But they don't care about whether we've got the loopholes closed or not. Okay, we have time for one last question. Go ahead, Nicole. Yes. All right. Well, um, so when Romney was campaigning in Virginia, uh, along with Paul Ryan, they talked about how the defense cuts that the sequester is going to take into effect will cost uh, 20,000 jobs in Virginia. So I want to ask the Republican side, was that really politicking? Did it, was he just kind of playing to the crowd? Or uh, does Romney believe that defense spending creates jobs? And if so, what is the difference between defense spending creating jobs and other government spending on infrastructure? Uh, Well, I, if the, the Obama, Obama administration was spending on infrastructure, that would be great. If the $787 billion American Recovery and Reinvestment Act had been spent on infrastructure, that would have been just great. But when they finished with the $787 billion, which is, you know, Solyndra and all these other crazy programs, then... Uh, then the, the Obama administration says, well, our infrastructure's all crumbling. We need more money. We need to spend more. Well, what did they do with the $787 billion? They spent it on infrastructure. Very little was spent. Very little was spent on infrastructure. Maybe if you count the, uh, the, 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 the rest, drop on, uh, rest stop on I-95 as building on infrastructure. But we have bridges that are crumbling. And that's where the money should have all gone, not for tax cuts, not to, that led people to run off with their $2,000 to Walmart to buy Chinese goods. And one of the other problems here is we live in an open economy, not a closed economy. I haven't heard anything about the effect of savings on exchange rates and the effects on our net exports. And that is an, an amazing oversight. We've heard closed economy, Keynesian economics on the macro side, and I think that's a terrible oversight. You have a minute and a half. Well, we found something that we agree on. Uh, Professor Abrams is now a Democrat. He believes in government infrastructure spending. I congratulate him on his conversion. 
Um, that is exactly the critical. Eisenhower built the interstate highway system. <laughs> that is exactly the critical role of government, and it's exactly what would be eviscerated by the Republicans. Exa and where were the Republicans in 2009 proposing a set of, of spending on infrastructure and so on when the economy badly needed demand? You see, until we pull this out of Professor Abrams, the only thing you get from the Republican side is government spending is the source of the problems. Like President Reagan said, government is the problem. That's the simplified view of the world. And they're more interested in criticizing government than using it when you're in an economic emergency. I'm glad to see this. I'd like to see the Republicans in Congress say we'd like a big infrastructure bill. President Obama would sign it so fast, but that's not what Congress said. Speaker Boehner said we're not passing anything. And with okay, low interest bad. rates, this is exactly the time to do it because interest rates are so low. This is the image that you will want for yourselves and your children. Yes? Yes. Okay, Romney, you have 30 seconds to reply. It would be fine if the money really were spent on needed needed infrastructure, uh, but it wasn't. A lot of it was used to prop up um, state and local governments had gotten very bloated during the uh, prior years that um, had more uh, workers than they really could afford given their tax base. A lot of that stimulus money really did not go to any productive use at all, as we now are watching um, with an unemployment rate at a measured 8%, some estimate as high as 7% if we included everybody who's dropped out of the labor force. Okay, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and spending time with us. And just one last thing, if you haven't already done so, you may have, but if you haven't, be sure tomorrow to go out and vote. Good night. <laughs>